Hey, you're watching part two. To After Hours with Richter, featuring Dr. Dissetail and Dr. Hart. As you can see, we're at the airport. We had to do some necessary traveling to do some checks and balances on Dr. Ketchum on her work with her DNA paper. Where's the paper trail? We'll watch our webcast and find out. That's right, Richter. Welcome to After Hours. My name is Richter. I am your host. Richter! What? Leave him alone! It's Judgment Day for Sasquatch. Thanks for dropping me like a stud. <laughs> now we got Richter going. We're going to have to hear it about it all night. Yeah. <laughs> that's a bunch of screaming meanies out there, and that's the scoop that has been reported so far. By your opinion that you are no-kill, you are dooming the species to be extinct. Well, when you don't believe in Bigfoot, everything you see that might be one is something else. We thought that we had the holy grail of DNA. When are we going to make a video, Richter? And I mean not an X-rated one. Dr. Todd, you've also been called the scoff dick. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> you can't talk about that. I can't! Hello? Is this thing on? Am I muted? Can you hear me? Hey, Richter, I've got a question for you. How does it feel to lose Bigfoot Bounty? Hmm. My question is, why do you think Bigfoot is real? Thanks for joining us for part two of After Hours with Richter. I'm your host. My name is Richter Riolo from Spike TV's $10 million Bigfoot Bounty. Now, if you watch part one, you totally got an earful from two respected doctors in science in regards to Bigfoot. Is it real? Is it not? Uh, debating on what was presented by Dr. Melba Ketchum with her paper on Sasquatch that you have to pay for in order to read, which is apparently free now, right, Dr. Hart? Yes, correct. Mm, still not worth reading, in my opinion. Anyways, um... <laughs> This is now part two. We have Dr. Hart, Dr. Todd Disatel from Bigfoot Bounty, and my beautiful co-host, Tammy Murray. Hi, Richter. How you doing? I'm so excited to be here with Dr. Disatel and Dr. Hart. <laughs> I apologize for us right now, Dr. Hart. We digress. Oh. Um, we really hey, uh, we don't fit in socially. <laughs> well, I, I like the digression. Well, Richter. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Todd. My new kicks. Cool. Oh, Imperial. You yeah. are a sharp dressed man. I got all, I have five of the seven van Star Wars suits. Mm. My wife is not happy. I, I'm sorry, Hurricane Natalia was in town, so one of my, uh, one of Tammy's watches uh, downtown. But I have two handy. You're but quite the collector. Gentlemen, we ask these questions of all our guests. <laughs> you two being highly respectable in my book. I have to ask you this. Is there any evidence of any creature on this planet that has any kind of telepathic powers to tell you they are the watchers of man, the descendants of Cain. We are watching you. And cloaking, like as if they can suddenly go invisible. And Bigfoot zapping, how they'll zap you with fear. Is that pheromones? And the interdimensional species that people think that these things are. Is there any scientific evidence to back that up? No. No. I'm not even going to qualify it. <laughs> yeah. Same here. No. <laughs> no. What, TV shows on it. Okay, so what are these people then, are, they're obviously projecting their own beliefs and hopes and aspirations into what they're experiencing. So the zapping thing, could that be just the fear? You know that something's watching you and you feel the you know the hair on the back of your neck standing up, the fight or flee experience? Is that what that is? What? No, they watch a little too much Star Trek. Yeah, that's right. I would love to see somebody do an in-depth analysis if the concept of cloaking 
existed before Star Trek aired. <laughs> there was a single literature reference to cloaking before Star Trek. Cliff Barrickman from Finding Bigfoot is a friend of ours, and he uh, says that if Bigfoot is real, it has to be a part of the living natural earth. It requires food, water, shelter, procreation. You know, that's it. I mean, Here there's just... I completely agree with him. You know, uh, yeah. Now, Dr. Hart, when you said that you first became interested in Bigfoot because of the Patterson-Gimlin film, let's think about this footage. These two gentlemen on horseback come upon this creature. It gets up from wherever it was sitting and starts trotting off away from the gentleman. Bob Gimlin on his horse crosses over the creek and makes the paddy creature turn and it turns its upper body. It doesn't have like a neck like we do. Looks back and continues on her way. And she's gone her way. It's definitely a female. Whatever this thing is has breasts. Okay, if they have these interdimensional doorways, she must have lost the phone number to access it with her, you know, scientific boogaloo. Because she just kept on walking. There was no magic. There was no orbs, right? I mean, it was, a, if this was real, a living creature leaving the scene. It didn't give well, Bob uh, Gimlin and Roger Patterson telepathy. No, she just t took off, left the scene quickly and effectively, right? I mean, there was no boogaboo there. No, nothing apparent. Um, I'm still um, very uh, undecided about that film. Uh, there have been studies by co about costume es experts from Hollywood who said that nobody could uh, make a costume that good at that time that would show the muscle flexure and tone that, that one does, and then uh, you know, I I still don't know if it's a hoax or not. Um, I, I just and I don't know that we'll ever know really. There'll be a lot of opinions on both sides, and uh, you know, with some valid reasons behind them. So I I can only encourage all three of you to read a book I just finished. Um, Donald Prothero and Daniel Loxton's Abominable Science. It's absolutely worth a read. Just buy the cheap Kindle version. <laughs> um, they go in depth into Bigfoot, Yeti, Nessie, and other stuff. And they have, so one of them is like a skeptic, and one of them is actually a paleontologist. And uh, they have a great, great section on the Patterson-Gimlin film that I think every squatcher needs to read, and it will be very uncomfortable <laughs> for squatchers to read that. Why? Because uh, they don't come out in favor of it. Um, yeah. But as most of the footprints, you know, um, back to all the way back to 58. So, I mean, they basically, you know, dismiss all of those. But the, the thing I, so I now have way too many Squatcher friends. <laughs> and I love you two guys. But I got way too many. I, I'm hip deep in this shit now. I mean, shit, look. <laughs> That's a great that asshole. I love it. <laughs> um, I uh, there's so much I want these people to read, and they're like, "Oh, I don't like to read." It's like, ah, just read this article, read this book chapter, read this, you know, magazine expose. There's if you're a researcher, and again, I said I'm not going to be popular by saying 98% of Bigfoot researchers aren't researchers. They need to read things like this abominable science. They need to read Brian Sykes's work. They need to read this stuff. And it's like, oh, I don't like reading, or it has an equation in it. I'm ah. equation. 
are you saying that Bigfoot research doesn't always involve going out in the field and looking for evidence? Going out in the fucking woods is nothing. You need to understand, one, what are you looking for? And two, how do you document it? What's the likelihood? Uh, ask Natalia Reagan. I mean, she's done a whole bunch of videos about what you should do. Did someone say ask Natalia Reagan? <sighs> That's me. Hey guys. I'm the big door. Anyways, I heard you talking about weekend Bigfooters versus those that read up all the books on Bigfoot. Maybe you'd call them armchair squatchers, if you will. Um, and truth be told, you got to do both. You got to do the research. You got to read those books. You got to understand what you're looking for before you actually go set foot in the forest looking for it, right? I mean, that makes sense. Um, before I go out into the field, before I jump on a plane and go to Panama, you know, I, I don't just decide one day, you know, go down to my field site and find spider monkeys. I have to do months worth of research, reading, reading, reading about the diet of spider monkeys, the locomotion of spider monkeys, the reproductive strategies of spider monkeys, where these spider monkeys are going to be found before I can go look for them. So similarly, you're going to do the same thing when it comes to this new species you know, being Bigfoot. Uh, so, for instance, if you think Bigfoot is a descendant of Gigantopithecus or Homo erectus, you're going to do as much reading on those particular species. If you think Bigfoot is a lot like a uh, large-bodied um, uh, primate, like a gorilla, you're going to do as much research as you can about, about gorillas. You're going to understand their diet, they're primarily vegetarian. You're going to understand the reproductive strategies, living in, in harem groups. Um, you're going to understand their mode of locomotion, their knuckle walkers and um, they're not very good bipeds. So you're going to do a lot of research before you even go out into the forest. And when you do go out in the forest, you're going to take all the stuff that you learned and uh, you're going to put that to good use. And then hopefully you'll, you know, do your best picking, picking up biomaterials. If you find hair, scat, maybe a suspect bone, perhaps even tools, because if you think Bigfoot's a hunter, how is he hunting his kills? Um, does he have a tool industry? You know? Um, you're going to go out and collect that, you know, those biomaterials using the correct protocol. You're going to put on gloves, you're going to use sterile instruments, you're going to put it in a sterile container, and, you know, you may do that with your six-pack of beers and your ladies and have a little fun, put on some Leonard Skinner, whatevs. I, I don't judge. I actually sounds kind of fun. Um, but you're going to go out there and you're going to take it seriously and, uh, you know, put to use your theories. And once you get all those biomaterials and you have your fun weekend, you're going to take them back to the real world and test them in a, in a DNA lab. And not everybody has the luxury of you know, Dr. Todd's badass mobile DNA lab, but if you're really serious about squatching and you really want to get DNA evidence out, you know, out of what you found, you're going to find a lab that will take your materials and you'll test them. Um, and so you, it's, it's, it's a multiple step process. Um, you, again, research is, is very important beforehand and also following through once you get your biomaterials, testing them afterwards. Um, all of that is very important if you want to conduct a real scientific inquiry. And who knows? You never know what you're going to find. You've got to stay open about this kind of stuff, right? Mm. So anyways, hope this helps. Happy squatching, everybody. You know, have fun. Drink responsibly. Squatch responsibly. Auf Wiedersehen. Just going out for the weekend with your gun and crossbow and camera trap and shit, it's not enough. You need to read literally both sides of the story. Hey, that crossbow is for zombies. I just want you to know that. Uh, it's, it's on my Amazon wish list if anybody's <laughs> looking. Almost got one for Father's Day, but... Alas, it didn't happen. Somebody get that man a crossbow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm by the, I'm, the, the hard thing is finding the right one. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, 20 inch, 16 inch. I know what Richter likes, but. <laughs> <laughs> Anything over 7 inches will do just fine. Okay. <laughs> but, no, seriously, I want. Anybody who wants to call themselves a Bigfoot researcher, 
needs to read some basic literature on what research is, what the scientific method is, and both the skeptics and the believers. I mean, I'm blown away by the guys who can tell me 17 different sighting reports over the last 17 years in this particular locale, but they haven't read one thing from a wildlife biologist. You know, like, there's bears in the here woods, you know. Um, well, look at Tim Treadwell. Look what happened to him back in, what, 2003? Yeah. Or, but again, I'm a researcher. I don't want people calling them researchers unless, and I'm all in favor of, of amateur research and amateur naturalists and all that. That's awesome. The more of those we have, the better. But you've got to understand what the term research means. Boy, howdy. <laughs> And, you know, so I am not a believer. I'm a skeptic. I've always said that. But I have never said the dude doesn't exist. I can't. A scientist can't say that. No, then you'd be advocating for your own beliefs. Right. And I'm just saying it's an extremely low probability. And so-called Bigfoot researchers have an extremely high bar to cross, and they should. You don't overturn scientific dogma, belief, paradigms on whims or visual sightings or casts of footprints. You need verifiable, repeatable data. Show me the data. Yeah, and you sure don't uh, prove the existence of Bigfoot by uh, listening to all of your buddies' stories in the, the Bigfoot world and oh, all the witness oh. testimonies. They are probably the worst example Wait, of evidence. Eyewitness testimony, trackways, and those data, they, they're not data. Sorry, full stop. And I will be unpopular amongst many people, but of a million footprint casts are worth nothing compared to actual biological sample. Trackways are not a biological sample. Sorry. And let's face it, people lie. Well, for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. Delusion, belief, religion, money, uh, dire, uh, <laughs> People lie. Mm -hmm. or, but I, I think most of the Bigfoot sightings and believers, I don't think they're outright lying. They all, there's, a, there's a ton of hoaxing. I mean, a ton of hoaxing. But I think many of them are just deluded. They want to believe. Mm -hmm. It's like the aliens, people. Yeah. And don't get me started there. <laughs> okay. One of our viewers wants to know, what happened to your mohawk? I got old and lazy. So a mohawk, you need a mirror in the shower, you know, and carefully do it. And every week you got to go to the barber to fix nicks and straighten it. And it gets narrower and narrower every week. If you watch the show, it got narrower and narrower and narrower. <laughs> uh, so the, the night of the premiere party, after all of the um, PR stuff and interviews were done, uh, Natalia was actually in New York, and my wife Natalia and I threw a premiere night party at a pub in Greenwich Village. And we drove home afterwards, and I shaved it off that night with the clippers, and then the next morning carefully got rid of it. And then I went off to Cambridge, England for 10 weeks for my sabbatical. See, I so, thought maybe you shaved it for England to be taken more seriously by those Brits. Uh, not for the... I had... So 
I had a Mohawk for about five years, and my Nat Geo shows and History Channel, all my Monster Quests, had the Mohawk. But I got rid of it for those very reasons. It's just annoying to deal with. But Spike had asked me to bring it back. So well, and it I made you look good. It gave you an edge. And bitching for 31 straight days about it, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> So uh, it's just so much easier to just blindly shave in the shower and not have to worry about it and go to the barber to have it fixed and all have product and all that crap. See, I envy you because, as you can see, I cannot grow a mohawk. Oh, yeah. my God, you need to cut that stuff. <laughs> what happened? You, you were bald. I know, but I've been growing my hair out. It looks good with this, with the hat. But oh, man. Yeah. Haskell, another question. Yeah. Haskell and I um, have a higher testosterone rate than the two of you. Uh, um, oh, no. I, if I let this go for two days, boom, I look like Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I just thought of another question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's the beer or what, but... Um, what beer? That's important. No. Oh, what beer? It is something I found at our local liquor store in Guthrie. Okay. Okay, Scotch. so it's decent. Squatch Ale. Scotch. Yeah, it's decent for Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm trapped in Oklahoma. It's but okay. I, I wouldn't want to move to Texas either. I, well, I feel for you, Haskell, because it's hot down there. Yeah. Okay, my question for Haskell, and this is a specific question for you, because um, I don't know how long you've been uh, hanging out in the Facebook groups for Bigfoot topics, uh, but what, what do you think of the current state of the Bigfoot community on Facebook? Well, I'll be honest. I think I joined Facebook mainly so I could follow what the Bigfoot community was doing. So that's only been about a year and a half ago. And uh, I, it's very mixed. I mean, most of the people probably have no right to their opinion because they haven't done any homework or any, you know, any, any research, certainly. Um, but I do think that there are enough people who've done enough homework and looked into things seriously that some some of these issues can be kind of sorted out. Um, but um, you know, it's it's as good as any of the other discussion groups out there too. I think so. I don't think we should be too hard on ourselves. It is not a, a scientific form per se. Um, anything comparable to a scientific meeting or anything like that, but um, I'm, I'm okay with it. You, you have to be selective or you can waste a lot of time, though, too. How, how do you feel about the uh, cultish Bigfoot groups out there that are, um, are so using demanding? Bigfoot, people? Yeah, using Bigfoot as a theological um, point of interest. Uh, well, I'm not too familiar with that, quite honestly. Um, I'm not a very religious person, so you know, I don't, I don't mix those things together, even pseudoscience with religion. Um, so I, I think uh, you know, we're getting some really weird, way out stuff there, and uh, the little bit I've seen, I mean, and uh, I think even Melba Ketchum now is starting. She, her latest post was. She found a picture of St. Christopher with a dog head, so I'm sure she thinks that that's probably sample 140. A hybrid. It's a yeah, hybrid. it's a hybrid, right. And I just got back to Europe in one of the famous cathedrals, I think, I think it may have been Toledo in Spain, they did have a, a very large mural of St. Christopher, and the Catholic version anyway does not have a dog head. So I, I kind of I, I don't I don't take any of that seriously, um, um, but you know they have their rights to say what they think. But I don't try to get too involved. 
I find I'm I'm actually very active on Facebook with uh, multiple audiences, colleagues, friends, family, etc., and the Bigfoot community. But I've really restricted my commenting in the Bigfoot community because I, I it's it's a vortex. It's like a black hole you could be sucked into. <laughs> And I, I'm sure Haskell also, as he's surfing it, like, nah, here I could comment, but it's just going to bring out the trolls and all of the other stuff. And um, so I, I probably get five friend requests a day, and I quickly look at who their friends are, and that determines if they enter... <laughs> into my list, unfortunately. And I, I've restricted my friend list to the people I know from the show, a couple others, you guys, and people close to you guys, but not just Squatcher, because uh, my feed would all day long be showing me tree stumps and moss and blurry photos and other things. Um, and even when the few things I'm involved with, there's like, oh, look at this picture. It's like, that's a fucking stump. Um, I won't comment. I, I made the mistake about two months ago of some guy called me out. Might have even been on Zen Yeti, but he like asked. Doctor Todd, just leave that group. It's a dead group. The only person okay. posting in there is Simon Hicks. Yeah, but um, I I did two posts about like the actual data and some less than brilliant guy kept on coming back with Ketchum stuff and I just stopped. Um, so I, I, I don't even want to say I'm open to the stuff. I mean obviously I am because I've been involved but I'm hyper skeptical as any scientist should be hyper skeptical about everything. Every discovery you make you have to worry about, am I wrong? So, uh, if you give me a second here, case in point. The manuscript, I am, I have a 25-page article that I'm doing the page proofs. These are like the final things, just dotting the I's and crossing the T's before it gets published. It was, it's a revision of an article I did in 2006. And it turns out in 2006, I was totally wrong compared to what we know today. And so my new version of this article is like, well, I was totally wrong then. Then the data said this. Since then, the data now says 180 degrees different. And I just had to say, I was wrong. I was proven wrong by new data and new results. That's the most important statement a scientist can make, is saying, I was wrong. If you can't say, I was wrong, you're not a scientist. What do you think about that, Haskell? I totally agree. Um, I've, I've had similar experiences to what uh, you just described. Uh, in your recent paper, and it's a very humbling thing. Not everybody can be that humble, especially when you put things in writing and people have re reviewed it and said they agreed with you and so on, and still you're wrong. So right. I, I, I agree with the point. If you can't say you're wrong, you're not a scientist, because science changes. I mean, good grief. Um, just look at the history of... Uh, uh, the knowledge of atoms and quantum mechanics and things and people had wrong ideas and and they have to admit or they pass away before it gets proven maybe but absolutely you're right we have a question from our one viewer <laughs> I have shared our hangout with someone uh -oh. uh, Dr. <laughs> Todd is making excellent comments have y'all covered the question of what we're going to do with Melba's legacy? 
Do you think it will just fade away, or will conspiracy theorists and the deluded always give it an audience? They won't. It will fade away. My my prediction, prove me wrong. And Dr. Hart? I agree. I think they'll find something else. Um, they'll move on to some other person. Um, ho hopefully uh, they, they'll find something that, that has some more validity, but... Um, it, I've noticed already on her Facebook page that there's a lot less comment from other people. It's mostly her own stuff at, at the moment, so people are dropping off the turnip wagon. I got a couple more questions for you gentlemen, and then we'll end this. Earlier, uh, Dr. Hart said that he thinks that Bigfoot could quite possibly be a feral human. Dr. Todd, I remember you talking on that television show called the $10 million Bigfoot Bounty. You watched it? I did. I not only did, did I watch it, but I somehow feel like I lived it. Uh, wow. I'm a fan. I, 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 I remember being awfully wet about it at one point. Be <laughs> a <you> fan, <laughs> You said, Dr. Todd, that there's no such thing as feral humans. Uh, I mean... Technically speaking, well, so Haskell raised an interesting point. And so feral is a behavior, and he talked about people raised in Africa, or there's stories about in Europe about, you know, people raised by wolves. I mean, that's how Rome was founded, after all. Um, <laughs> but it's not in the DNA. So there's, there's no way a DNA analysis will ever yield the result feral human. Because DNA does not yield behavior. Right. A psychological analysis might say, yeah, Romulus and Remus were raised by wolves, <laughs> or these kids were abandoned early and whatever, but you are not going to have a blast search, that's the technical term of searching this massive DNA database, yield the term feral human. Right, I totally agree with that. It's, it's a behavioral term and an adaptive kind of a term. Um, and, you know, I, it's just a shot in the dark. I, I don't even know what the probability of that would be, but uh, there are such people that do show up at times. What do you think about the um, the fact that people, whenever they are out in the in that situation, children? I've seen some of the things that you've talked about with children that have uh, gotten lost or whatever in the wilds of Africa and have come back to even as soon as two years later with hair all over their body. Um, what do you think about that as far as um, an adaptive thing? It's, it's certainly not by choice. It's not a behavior. It's, it's an adaptive thing. So there's something in our physical makeup that allows us to change to uh, adapt to our environment, right? So say you have a group of people that have lived like this for some time and they they procreate and they have they have offspring and are, are the offspring they are, they're going to be born with this adaptation and go on is this something a possibility uh, but the, the example I think you just said was like oh they were gone for two years well that was the minimum I saw one of the stories about a little kid um, I don't remember the exact age of the kid he was like toddler size and was gone for I think it was two to three years and no, when he was gone, he had it, hair all over his body fur it was not like a, like what Bigfoot hair is described as it was fur is this verified or it was a television show what yeah. who knows okay. Bigfoot so, Bounty. <laughs> just reality uh, TV, like Bigfoot Bounty. Yeah, no, I'm just saying, you know, data. Yeah. <laughs> data. And your scenario, though, you would need, hun I mean, you would need, 
you know, human generation time is somewhere between 20 and 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if... From the 50s or maybe the, the um, 1890s? One generation is not going to yield evolution. Well, I'm not talking about evolution. I'm talking about adaptation. Well, adaptation is evolution. Oh, thank you, Dr. Todd. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Todd. <laughs> you just won a debate. I <laughs> love you, Dr. Todd. <laughs> oh, speak, Tammy, speak. <laughs> I would put my butt up in front of the camera, but, you know. <laughs> Unlike Richter, I experience shame. <laughs> yes, I have no shame. <laughs> yeah, Adaptation I, is I evolution. Wait. You heard it on well, afternoon. The, the fact right. that these kids go out into the wild and, and grow fur is evolution, or is it adaptation? No, no it's not shaving for a couple, year, two years. Well, have you seen my legs, sweetie? No, do not show it. No, please. Oh, but seriously, you... Your grandchildren, if you don't shave for a couple of weeks, your grandchildren, or if you never shave again, your granddaughters aren't going to have hairy, well, they'll have as hairy legs as women who don't shave their legs will have, but it's not, not going to be well, and you factor in the fact that they're not wearing clothing to, you know, break off the... It, it's, it takes, it has to be... Adaptation, which is people do not evolve. I mean, we use that term, I've evolved, but no, we don't. It's populations evolve, genes evolve. It takes generations. It takes hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of years to change a population. To change a bunch of people from being relatively hairless to being furred is going to take 10,000 to 10 million years, not to 20 or 100. So why do these kids come back with fur? Just because they haven't had clothes on? And uh, they're is there data that these kids came back with fur? I don't know. Or is this the overzealous reporting of a reporter, a chronicler, or whoever, oh, they were in the forest for two years, now they're animals. Uh, so, okay, so this is debunking the, the whole uh, kids reverting back to feral... Show me the data. Very Show me. Okay. Yeah. Data, data, data. Sorry, it's just a really boring scientific litany. Data, data, data. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay, um, our viewer asked, I wonder <laughs> if they arose from children abandoned by primitive tribes with wolf boy syndrome, downs, etc., and they formed their own population where their deformities became dominant traits. Tribal people will leave different kids out in the woods to die. Is this a dumb idea if they already had these genetic conditions? Hmm. Good question. So my initial response is a bunch of people, let's say you leave your deformed kids, whatever you want to call them, out in the woods unlikely they're going to survive in the first place. Unlikely they're going to find a mate in the second place. Figure out what to do with the mate in the third place. Those offspring, uh, you know, just take this scenario further. I'm picturing Lord of the Flies for some reason. They could find an angel to breed <laughs> with, or an alien. So it's well, a fat, so you're saying, Doctor Todd, it's a fat chance. It's 
uh, what's Natalia? Uh, Natalia and I came up with the probability is adjacent to zero. <laughs> adjacent to not zero. impossible, but it's adjacent to it. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Well, there's one other condition that I'm not real familiar with, but I have seen documented, is when a person is born uh, with a lot of hair. Um, it's a genetic defect of some sort, but they do kind of look um, apish because of all the hair. Have you ever uh, had any con contact with any, any of that kind of uh, study, Dr. Todd? It's 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 a condition and it happens, but uh, they have a very low reproduction rate. There are people who do have these various conditions. They I forget I forget the medical term for this hyper hirsutism. Hyper trichosis or something? Yeah, that one. <laughs> I'm uh, smart. Not a brick. I'm smart. They don't, uh, they don't breed very well. And so they don't pass it on. And so while there may be an individual who's hairy and furry, and maybe some big ass tall dude who's six eight has it, but that ain't a population inhabiting the Pacific Northwest. Just my opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I've never heard of any population of such individuals. It's always a, an odd person here and there. Yeah, and I mean, to me, one of the biggest things against the whole, and I'm willing to call it the Bigfoot hypothesis, is this thing called demography and population genetics. It can't be a single one hiding out. It's got to be hundreds, if not thousands, of them. And for hundreds to thousands of them to stay completely off the grid and cryptic, I'm skeptical because I'm a scientist. I have one last question, and it's for Dr. Todd. Recently, a friend of mine told me that my time with Dr. Todd and collecting DNA and learning about DNA does not count because it was from a television show. And that pissed me the f*** off because half of those Bigfoot researchers out there do not know how to collect DNA. And just because I was with Dr. Todd for a month out in Washington learning how to do it right, that doesn't mean I don't know what the f*** I'm doing because I don't have the years of Bigfoot expertise and research behind me like all those other hicks. And, mm, hey, just, mm. I take the word hick personally, but I'd like to say something here about the people that you know, call what you do not being researched, they can suck it! <laughs> <laughs> but see, Tammy was there when this occurred. I'm like, I'm like, this individual, we'll call him Matt, for example. Matt, you weren't there when the doctor showed us how to collect data and there's certain principles that you must adhere to when out in the field. And he says it doesn't matter if it was for a TV show. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Todd? So, Matt, fuck off, if that's your name. Um, what we demonstrated to them on the TV show, it's real. And until you show me one fucking single data point, uh, you are worthless. Oh, hell yeah. a single data point. Thank you. I mean, Richter hasn't yet, but Richter at least now knows how to collect a potential data point. 
Whoever you are, troll, <laughs> show me the fucking data. Full stop. Sorry. Just seriously, dudes. Or do that. Show me the data. Don't troll on Richter for being on a TV show. Show me a single data point that's credible, testable, and verifiable. Until that, you're not a researcher. And as I said, most of these people aren't researchers. I know Richter wants to believe, but I know he knows how to do this now. And if it just shows up negative, he'll accept it. Well, Dr. Todd, he'll you yourself have said you yourself have said that, you know, my mouth could be like a treasure trove of DNA samples. So I just gotta stick to doing what I know how to do and we might get that one percent that I'll you bet can... you that's more accurate than we can all even imagine. <laughs> well, if anybody's going to get that sample, it probably will be Richter. That's right. Yep. If Stacy's right, but that's a whole nother issue. <laughs> Thank you for your uninformed opinion. So back to the you know the original topic of this interview with Dr. Hart's paper. I just want to go back to one other thing on this, if I can, Richter. Okay, go ahead, please. And just as an example, I just went to page 16 of the paper, which talks about sample 31. You know, and, and Todd's talking about, show me the data. And I highlighted one sentence in this that really stuck out to me as, as being, um, you know, the basis of why this paper of Melba's is, um, well, let's see, what are the words that I used earlier in my... <laughs> Uh, ignorance, uh, I think I used conspiracy, uh, you know, some other words that I threw around. Anyway, the, the thing that I highlighted was that as, as far as the sample 31 on your paper, Dr. Hart, it says most of the matches to human are so good, often a hundred percent identity, that the possibility of another extant hominin is not likely. <laughs> Can you uh, explain that sense a little bit further for us so that we can kind of wrap this up on on the whole uh, purpose of your paper and basically debunking the Ketchum study? Well, um, the thing is, you know, if it's matching human that well, um, surely there must be some, if this is a hairy creature that doesn't talk, that um, does all these strange things, surely there must be some differences in its DNA makeup compared to a human, if, if it exists. And, and, it, and that's all, it's just a very simple statement that if you believe in phylogeny and the fact that, you know, the DNA is essentially, essentially what you are, um, I need to see some difference there to um, differentiate it from from a human and um, Dr. Todd could say a lot more about this I don't know what he would expect for a subspecies or uh, something of that nature it, it, it certainly um, a very it has to be at least a very very close subspecies and I'm not even sure that uh, with that kind of agreement all right, and you said no evidence of human primate mosaic mentioned in the Ketchum conclusion above was found, above referring to what you talked about previous to that. So, um, like okay. you said, that would have resulted in some kind of change, something different, right, for uh, all well, of us. In yeah, terms. you talk about a hybrid and a mosaic DNA of uh, human and primate, and I didn't find that. If you look at my figures, I tried to graphically display all the hits that I got, all the good hits above 95% uh, ID. And I don't see, um, you know, human and primate um, having 
equally good or even close to equally good matches in different ranges of that sequence. Um, the, the, the sequence is basically all human. There's a solid black line of uh, points uh, at 100%. It's the more near 99, and if you look, the green points are, are other primates, and they don't come close to that. They're all way down toward 95 or 96 percent, and so that's that's the basis for my my comment there. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I mean Haskell's right on. I mean, one of the specialties of my research group is primate hybrids. We study hybrid guenons, hybrid baboons, hybrid macaques. So I, I have 15 papers on primate hybridization and new papers on human Neanderthal hybridization and stuff. This is not the signal of a hybrid. This is just straight out, that's a human sequence, that's a bear sequence, that's a dog sequence. They're not, there's zero evidence of hybridity. More importantly, the whole concept of 15,000 years ago hybridity, that's pulled out of thin air or I think the technical term is thin <laughs> fucking air. <laughs> so you're saying that if they are a subspecies of human, there would, there would be an obvious difference in the DNA, or no? Yes. <laughs> yes, there would be, and of course, I'm not an expert in that, um, but, and, and actually that particular sequence, that sample had the, the, the fewest base pairs, only a half a million. And I'm not even sure with that few that you would be able to detect, you know, you might just be missing where the differences are. And so, um, you know. With, with even that few, I mean, that's a whole lot of data, but you could tell if it was Neanderthal or Denisovan or just outside the range of the last 200,000 years. With that amount of data, that amount of data is absolutely square. Anatomically modern human, you and I. I would like the Squatch community to investigate, if they're researchers, researchers investigate. <laughs> 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 Investigate the money trails. What you're saying? There we go. Just saying, because that in in so many aspects of life, that what ultimately trips people up. Yeah, I totally agree. And okay. I, I've not made any accusation. Just saying, investigate and justify. It's highly suspicious. It's just all about checks and balances. It's what you're supposed to do as a scientist, right? Accountability? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes that. This has been a great two-part after hours with two amazing guests, Dr. Hart and Dr. Disatel. Thank you very much for coming on here, especially you, Dr. Hart, for being so brave and coming forward with your findings that contradict what the good Dr. Ketchum has given the Bigfoot community. So thank you for standing up for science and for hard work and due diligence. And Haskell, thank you for doing the work us lazier people or busier people should have done. You actually did an awesome job on that. Thank you. Well, thank you both for for your um, your kind words, and um, I'm I'm going to try to live up to to that. And uh, you may hear some more from me because I've got some other uh, investigations on the mitochondrial DNA, which was supposedly all human. Um, but one of those samples has, in fact, 17, 17 
uh, mutations from its nearest um, haplogroup. And in other words, you know, it That's really doesn't lot. fit that well either. That's a lot. Well, Dr. Hart, when you are ready to uh, publish, come forward, present your data, we will be here for you and would love to have you on again. Well, you'll be the first makes, to get it. Well, great. Thank you, because it makes great discussion and debate. You know, there's nothing wrong with debating what's being presented. And Richter is a master at debating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that leads me to my final question, and it's not to anybody here. It's to Melba Ketchum. <laughs> Melba, how does your paper prove that Sasquatch exists? I have no more comments. <laughs> you gotta believe. 